Well, thank you everyone uh, for coming in and braving the, uh, the rain that we just had. Uh, my name is Jason Lyle. I'm the James Wright Chair of Transnational Studies here in the Government Department. And yes, thank you. Uh, and uh, no need to clap for me. We want to save the clapping for our, our, esteemed, uh, our esteemed guest. This is Dr. Alex Downs, who is a professor from uh, George Washington University. And he is here today to speak to us about his brand new book, called Catastrophic Success. And we're going to be looking at the reasons why foreign imposed regime change have failed historically. And as we speak, literally in Ukraine and other settings. Uh, and what we wanted to do, this is sort of kick off kind of a, a new initiative joint between the Dartmouth Initiative for Global Security, DIGS, which is run by Dr. Daryl Press, uh, and my political violence field lab, uh, we wanted to bring in leading experts on contemporary world affairs who have written new books or new articles on sort of pressing um, sort of theoretical questions, but also really ones with policy relevance as well. And coming from DC, you're going to have a lot of policy, but we'll talk about <laughs> policy prescriptions. But we wanted to do it in a format that's a little bit different than the traditional talk. So most times when somebody comes in and gives a book talk, they're going to talk for 45 minutes at you, and then maybe we're going to get a little bit of a Q&A, and then, and then you sort of hopefully you'll go and buy the book, or at least you know what the argument is. What we're going to do is try something a little bit different. We're going to have a bit more of a dynamic conversation between the two of us uh, on the topics and themes of the book. And then uh, what we're going to do then is turn it over to the audience and sort of have a much more of a rich discussion rather than sort of being lectured at exactly. And we're going to see how this goes. But Beth's got a mic, right? Um, so what we'll do is once we get through our questions and, and we have a long history together, so we talk for a lot. Um, so we're going to try not to talk for the entire discussion. We will have um, a bit of a back and forth and then we'll turn it over to the audience uh, and so you can get to ask your own questions about regime change and, and things of that nature. But before we start, let me let me just read how esteemed our guest is. I already mentioned he's a professor of political science um, at GW, but um, he first came to prominence, I think we can say, with your first book, which is an absolute classic in the field, which won uh, Dr. Downs the the esteemed of what is it, the, the the incredible honor of the Joseph Lepgold Prize. Um, he has also won one of our largest uh, prizes, which is the Emerging Scholar Award for the top scholar in security studies under the age of 45. You were the inaugural winner of that. Just barely under 45. Just barely. It doesn't matter. As long as you're under the age, you get it. You get it. It doesn't count. Uh, he's published in every major journal in political science. Uh, his research is fun funded by a variety of different organizations, including the Minerva Initiative, which is a large uh, defense department initiative trying to get social scientists working on public policy matters. Although nothing you say today will be uh, attributable you. back to the defense department. Uh, Alex is speaking just in his own personal capacity uh, today. And, uh, and really just honestly, a, a rock star in the field. The book is fantastic. And um, he's quietly known as a sort of the shepherd of leading books in the field because everybody asks them to read their book before they send it to the publisher. He's kind of like the gatekeeper, which is why his books are so fantastic, but also why the ones that come after win awards is because you read them in advance. So I'm sure you're, you're incredibly versed across a, a wide range of topics, but today we're going to talk about foreign imposed regime change, right, which has a, a terrible acronym. I, I teach my students when we talk about war and peace and, and international security, it, the acronym is FERC which you have to be very, very careful of when you're tired lecturing, right? This is not a good acronym to be saying uh, very quickly. So we're just going to call it regime change. But I wonder if you could just start us out. We, we've seen regime, regime change seemingly fail in Ukraine. We've just witnessed last year the collapse of the regime in Kabul. Uh, we've seen the, the problems in Iraq, 2014-2015, right? Uh, Libya, we could ostensibly put underneath this regime change sort of um, record as well. So I wondered if you could just start us off sort of in the beginning and just tell us what, what do we mean by regime change? All right. Uh, uh, first of all, I just want to say thank you uh, to Professor Lyle for having me up here. Uh, it's great to be back uh, up here at Dartmouth. It's such a beautiful place. And one reason we know why the Joseph Lepgold Book Prize is so esteemed is that Professor Lyle's uh, book won it last year. Uh, well, they have to so. give it to somebody. But in, in your case, it was really earned. Mine. Please. Yeah. Please. Anyway, I, I appreciate the very kind introduction. Um, so yes, regime change. It's foreign imposed regime change is a long thing to say. So I'm not going to usually say FERC. I'm going to say regime change, and that's what I mean is the foreign imposed kind. Um, so what do we mean by that? Uh, it's essentially the uh, coerced or forced uh, removal of the leader of one government by another government. 
uh, at least the leader, sometimes also, you know, complete change of the, the governing institutions as well, but it at least moving out one leader and putting in a different one. Um, that's generally done in one of three ways. The obvious one is to invade with your own military forces and, and, and go to the capital and take the person out, move them out. Um, second one is through coercion or compellence. You make a threats of force. Say, unless you go, uh, we will invade or attack or uh, what, what have you. Um, and the third is by working with uh, actors inside the state. So in some kind of collaboration, either overtly um, uh, or covertly. Uh, in those cases, then you have to be careful about, well, was it really the intention of the intervener to be, to be going for overthrow? So I look for evidence of that. Uh, would, the, would the regime change have happened without the, out, without the external actors uh, uh, taking, taking action or not? Um, so that's basically what it is. Um, now, a lot of, uh, there have been other books written on regime change, like covert regime change. I have some covert cases uh, in my book, um, but a lot of them uh, written by, uh, a book written by my friend Lindsay O'Rourke, uh, America's Secret Wars, something like that. Um, she has a lot of covert regime changes, but actually only about a third of them are successful, and a lot of them consist of like election sort of manipulations or democracy promotion where it's quite difficult to make the connection from what the intervener is doing to the actual change of government. So I'm, most, I'm dealing with force and threats of force uh, uh, or military action. Um, so in terms of, uh, you know, you've hit some of the greatest hits of how things aren't work, haven't worked out lately. Um, one of the things that got me interested in this in the first place was you know, you may have, may have not quite yet been alive when this happened, but the U.S. invasion of Iraq, um, and uh, thinking about, hey, I'm not sure this is a good idea, and it turned out to, to be followed by a lot of problems. Um, uh, but a lot of people, you know, when they think of this, they think of West Germany uh, and Japan after World War II. In fact, I think U.S. policymakers, when they do this, that's the, that's the software they have in their head. We're going to look, it worked here. Uh, why wouldn't it work there? Um, so occasionally, right, there have been decent outcomes. Now, they're all, all not, not all nice, because the Soviet Union did this a number of times, and it was stable. It's hard to know whether you'd say successful, but they created themselves some nice uh, buffer states in Eastern Europe after World War II, and they did that by, you know, imposing an incredibly coercive state uh, on the top of them. So there are some cases where you have sort of peaceful relations afterwards, uh, but they're pretty rare and subject to a bunch of conditions that, that we can talk about later. Mm -hmm. So, okay, so paint us a picture. So one of the things that's really cool about the book is it's got a brand new data set underneath it of all of these uh, regime changes from, was it 1815 up, right? Yeah. So, so I, you said the greatest hits, so <laughs> Afghanistan, Iraq, <laughs> now we're seeing Ukraine being another example, Libya. So what, what is the... Are those typical, right? Is that is, is this like an unbroken record for the last 200 years of failure? Or is there is there actually some like shining lights in there? You, you alluded to maybe Japan or something like that. So can you sure. just sort of paint us the picture of like how, how bad is it? <laughs> yeah, so this gets to the question of different kinds of regime changes. So you think, well, I gave you this definition that's sort of the monolithic thing. And it, yeah. But it turns out there's different kinds. And I divide them into three types. Uh, and one that, that is, tends to be the least terrible or most benign is rest, what I call restorations. So think, uh, uh, think uh, Western European democracies at the end of World War II. Right? They're overthrown by Adolf Hitler. They go into exile somewhere. The Allies come in, put them back in power. All is good. Mm -hmm. um, or Haiti in 1994 when the U.S. came in and put... Uh, uh, Aristide uh, back in power. So those are tend to be less difficult because you're often putting, it's a democracy, putting another democracy back in power. They don't have a lot of strong interests there uh, that would come into conflict. There were a bunch of these in the 19th century by great powers against like tiny principalities in Europe where it was just like, nope, you're not going to have a revolution. We're going to crush this. Um, uh, the ones that turn out the worst are these, what I call leadership regime changes where you're just putting a sort of unsupported dictator in. 
uh, and they are sort of mo most dependent on you. And those are the ones that are responsible for most of the bad outcomes. Mm -hmm. And then the ones where you change institutions are kind of in the middle. Um, this is like trying to build democracy. And so building democracy is easier in some places than others. And where it works, like in rich places or homogeneous places like Japan, like a West Germany, um, it's more prone to succeed when you try to do it in Afghanistan, uh, Libya, uh, uh, Dominican Republic, countries in Central America. It's much, uh, much more difficult to do and tends to break down. Okay, so, so how many regime changes since 1800? Ah, yeah. yeah. Like, how have we tried? Or not yeah. just we tried? So there have been 120 uh, individual leaders removed okay. uh, in the time period that I cover. Um, and does anyone have a guess about what the mo who, which country has been the most, had the most leaders overthrown in this period? America. Oh, has, has had their own government overthrown. Yeah, but that's definitely right about who's doing. Yeah, that's right about that. <laughs> You're right about my next yeah, yeah. question. Right, <laughs> right. Mm. Yeah. So I know, I know that Jay will say Afghanistan. No, because it's second. <laughs> it's second, right? It's only it's <laughs> six. There's think closer to home, right? Yeah, it's actually Honduras. Honduras. Uh, and what's weird about that is uh, one thing that I came across in doing this work was. Central America was like a hotbed of regime change in the 19th century, and the great power there was Guatemala. And Guatemala ran roughshod yeah. over all these countries, El Salvador, Honduras, uh, in Central America. So only one of the Honduran regime changes was by the United States. Like seven were by uh, its neighbors, uh, more local neighbors. Then it's Afghanistan, yeah. after that, um, a few other places. Of course, the United States is the most frequent Perpetrator by far of regime right? changes. Yes, they have twice as many as right. the Soviet Union. You have 33. Um, the Soviets have 16, and then it's sort of Germany, France, Guatemala. <laughs> okay. So, lest you think this is just a great power thing. Yeah. So, okay. So, all right. So that's that's sort of the architecture. We've got like 118 leader change. 120. 120. So, of that, of those 120, how many ended up successful? And like, what, and what does success mean here in the sort of? Yeah, that's the that's the tricky thing here. How do you measure success right. or effectiveness? Other, you know, other uh, scholars have tried to come to some overall judgment of well, this was effective or successful or not successful. I decided not to do that. I decided to look at specific outcomes because I thought the doing it the other way is just super hard. Yeah. Um, and so I want things I can measure, right? So let's look at, uh, was there a civil war after the regime changed in the country? Let's look at, did the leaders stay in power? But the idea here is that you remove somebody who's causing you problems, put somebody else in who will do what you want, and then they stay there. They don't just get overthrown the next year. Uh, and then what's your relations like between the the country, the target country, and the intervening country. Presumably, they should improve, or at least not get worse. Um, so those are the three things I look at. Um, and I don't know exactly like how, which, what you'd say, uh, but m each of those things becomes more likely after regime change, right? So there's more civil wars. They're, the leaders are more likely to be overthrown through violence, uh, and the likelihood of conflict uh, does not go down, and in some cases it goes up for the leadership types, which are, are the worst ones. Okay, but tell me, we get democracy out of this, right? Surely we, we do all this, uh, and at the end yes. of the, do we get democracy? So in other work, uh, not in this, this book's about the, the violent outcomes, mm -hmm. um, but in related work, uh, I've looked at this question of democracy. So when democracies uh, intervene and do regime change, do you get democracy afterwards? Uh, the answer is usually no. One interesting thing that I discovered was that when democracies intervene, and again, this is the last couple hundred, uh, last century, was from 1900, uh, they only promote democracy in about less than one third of the cases. Right, so then, okay, let's look at that one third where they're trying to do this and what you see is 
uh, it's highly contingent on the conditions in the country. Mm. If the country has what you know, some comparative politics folks talk about as preconditions for democracy, like high levels of economic development, middle class, econo- uh, excuse me, ethnic uh, homogeneity, a previous experience with constitutional rule, much more likely to transition to democracy. If you don't have those things, it's not going to happen. And the problem is there's only about three <laughs> of those cases where you had those things. And they're very unique circumstances, West Germany and Japan being at the top of the list. And what makes them unique is they had all those conditions, plus there was this thing called the Soviet Union sitting out there. There was a giant threat that was shared by Germany, the United States, Japan, the United States. And so it made the people in those countries much more interested uh, in cooperating with the United States, because otherwise they'd be left to the tender mercies of the Soviets. So, unfortunately, the answer to that question is no. Okay, so now I'm going to paint like an incredibly stark picture, but see if I get this right. So there are 120 <laughs> of these things since about 1815. Most of them fail to generate democracy. A large percentage of these things, these interventions, fall into civil war right immediately afterwards, or in the ten period, ten year period afterwards. Right, um, the leaders don't usually stay. They don't have better foreign relations with the person that's intervening in these things, right? Um, I'm looking for a silver lining in here with these interventions because one of the things that's really interesting about it is that so many countries resort to this so often, uh-huh. and yet it doesn't actually seem to be generating anything that they're... So and this is a long way of asking, like, what was Vladimir Putin thinking uh-huh. when he invades Ukraine, right, and goes for <laughs> regime change, uh-huh. having this historical record behind that says none of this is going to work, Right. Is it something about that the fact that most of these are democracies that are doing the intervening, and it's, it's maybe it's a function mm. of being democracy and autocracy mm. can do this better, or is like everybody bad at this? Yeah, I'm full of uh, uh, you know good news okay. uh, today. So basically, the answer to that last thing is that everybody's bad at it. So the democracies, non-democracies, mm-hmm. sort of equally, uh, the outcomes are equally bad. Uh, no matter who does. So the good news, I guess, is that democracy is not uniquely bad uh, at this, uh, but they're certainly not privileged right. uh, in any way. Um, and so, you know, it's, it's one thing when we do these studies in hindsight and we find these patterns and, oh, it looks incredibly clear that this is going to fail all the time. You know, I don't think Vladimir Putin's well-schooled in the you know, many people said I should send this book. To, yeah, I mean, I was going to say, Putin. you should have read your book. Um, At least looked at the stats. One would, right. one would have hoped, but I don't think he was consulting it, unfortunately. Right. Um, so, but, um, I mean, it, it's, so there's a lot of reasons, none of which really fully add up, right? So one is, this seems so simple, right? The, the sort of theory guiding this is, well, we're having trouble with country X. Here's this guy or woman, although every case of my, only two cases in my data are, are of a woman being put in power, mm. um, uh, who looks like they, they share our interests, or they'll, they'll do what we want. At least that's what they're saying right now. Um, let's go in and plop them in and live happily ever after. Uh, and no one thinks about, well, will we break the state? In doing that, or will is there any countervailing force mm-hmm. that's going to push against that person that we place in power that to cause them to act in undesirable ways? At least from from our point of view. Mm-hmm. So hopefully my book will like shed some light on that. Yeah. Um, now another thing is it's easy. Like although most although all regime changes changers are not great powers, many are. And so there's an, a big power asymmetry, usually. And certainly this is the case with the United States in, in many cases, or going after very, you know, very small countries. And I was like, why are we bothering to try and coerce these people? Let's just get, get rid of the leader and put somebody else in. This is a waste of time. Um, so, and when you're really powerful, mm-hmm. you can do that. Mm-hmm. Uh, you know, there's a real short-term focus, like... You can see this in the Iraq case. This plan and plan about how the intervention is going to go, what are the military plans, and almost willful uh, uh, ignorance 
or punting of the post-war plan. And it's just remarkable, of course, that, that whole case, that yes. no one ever really decided what was going to happen afterwards. Um, and so the place kind of collapsed. Uh, bad intelligence or biased intelligence is a big thing. One of my favorite examples of that is, is this picture on the front of the book, uh, which I know it's morbid, but I really think it's a perfect cover for the book. That's the execution of Maximilian. Uh, by the, the liberals in Mexico in 1867. So it's a, it's a, it's a long story how a, an Austrian archduke came to be emperor of Mexico, but let's stipulate that he did. Uh, and it was after the, the liberals had overthrown the conservatives, taken over Mexico. Conservatives go over to Europe, and they start talking to Napoleon III in France, and they're like, oh yeah, people of Mexico really want an emperor. They want a monarchy. And so then he goes, they go to talk to Maximilian, who's the guy that Napoleon's trying to convince, and say, oh, yeah, yeah, there's a lot of support for, a, for a, a monarchy. And they're like, they don't know any better, right? And they're getting their intelligence, such as it was, from biased sources, right? Think of modern times. Think of Ahmed Chalabi, right? Ahmed Chalabi's running around whispering in people's ears about how this is going to be great. They're going to throw roses and flowers, and uh, the Iraqi people will you know, jump for joy. Um, and some people listen to that. Um, and then fi I'll, last thing, um, at least in the United States anyway, people tend to think of the Germany, they go to the Germany and Japan cases. Mm -hmm. um, even though, you know, sort of many studies have been done, not just by me, but others, that show this clear divide, right, that interventions for democracy in difficult places tend to end badly. Um, but this is a powerful belief uh, uh, and a, you know, an optimistic, hopeful belief that democracy can be planted anywhere. Right? People thought Germans were you know, totalitarian mindset and you'd never get democracy there. But it turns out we were wrong about what the, the sources of democracy were. Um, so there's, that, there's that, those glasses over people's eyes. I think we can, people anywhere. And, not to say that people in Iraq, Afghanistan, uh, Nicaragua, Dominican Republic are bad and don't want democracy, but just the, the seeds are not really there mm -hmm. in a lot of cases. I mean, one of the arguments made frequently about Putin's mistake is this biased intelligence story, right? Where he yeah. thought he had the, the Kyiv regime sort of penetrated with his spies. He knew that they were, the regime wasn't going to stand fast. He was listening to all those agents on the ground. They had hundreds of them compromised, and that turned out to be all wrong. Mm -hmm. Right, he'd been fed poor intelligence by his own intelligence agency, and then sort of kicks over the can, and now it's like he's yeah. in trouble, right? And so I think that's going to stand. I think that's clearly the case in 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 the Ukraine business, right? right. That was they looked. I, th I think they looked at the numbers and they said, "Oh, we have a pretty big army. We have right. a lot of tanks. We have a lot of men, and the Ukrainians don't have much. Right. This is going to be easy. Yeah. We'll just send the tanks to Kiev, and that, it'll be all she wrote, and we'll knock them over in a few days, uh, and." They didn't pay much attention to uh, non-intangible factors that they might have yes. benefited but from reading Professor Lyle's book. <laughs> yes, um, yeah, send that to Putin didn't, as well. And, you didn't know much about the Ukrainian capabilities, right. and you didn't know much about his own capabilities. Right? His army staffed with untrained conscripts, uh, people from you know, various ethnic groups, yeah. non-great Russians, not necessarily wanting to fight uh, and die in Ukraine. Um, but yeah, that was, I think, a great example of the intelligence. I mean, one of the key policy lessons that come out for me is that if anyone ever comes to you and says intervention in a foreign country is going to be cheap and easy, you know that they're lying, right? They're totally wrong and they clearly haven't read your book or looked at any of the evidence. Um, yeah, if they say, if, you, if you're in the State Department or right. White House or on the NSC someday and someone says, I, Let's go and, and overthrow country X. I got. I know a guy. I right. got a guy. Right. Right. It'll work out. That's right. You don't have a guy, and it's totally wrong. And don't be do skeptical. It, right? <laughs> be very skeptical. Okay, but okay. So, but let's like add another sort of layer of nuance here because on the one hand, it's sort of like, well, intervention is hard. We don't see it necessarily until we do it, and it's hard. But like, what's the actual sort of mechanisms or reasons why the interventions fail? Then, right? Like what it's what's in your view? Like, what's driving these collapses in Kabul and? Baghdad. Yeah, so uh, in the book I focus on two 
mechanisms, right, whereby regime change leads to these different violent outcomes. Uh, the first is what I call military disintegration. And this is the kind of the breaking the state thing that I mentioned before. But specifically, it's the army, the enemy army. Because um, sometimes you attack and the other side, you, you win some battles, the other side says, okay, we've had it, right? we give up, we surrender, or we negotiate an end to the war. The, the military stays intact, um, it surrenders in an orderly way, it's basically under control. Okay? That's usually what happens. Um, in other cases, uh, a country invades another country and the army kind of blows up, it shatters, uh, and sometimes that army is built from uh, uh, the kinds of states that, that Jay talks about in his book um, that are very fragile. Sometimes they're built by personal dictatorships and therefore they're purposefully taught not to fight very well. Um, but for whatever reason, uh, they shatter uh, when the, the attack comes. And so when the regime change happens, especially if the leader gets away, which sometimes happens, he has instant insurgency, right? Because there's thousands, tens of thousands, sometimes hundreds of thousands of armed people waiting to be uh, mobilized, right, to come back uh, at the, the regime changer. Um, and it helps if there are sort of remote parts of the country, right? In Peru in, in the 1880s, it was the Andes. Uh, in Cambodia in the late 1970s, it was the Thai border. If there was a sanctuary across the Thai border where the Khmer Rouge fled and came back. In Afghanistan, it was Pakistan. Um, uh, so that's, that's how you can get one of these outcomes, which is civil war, is this sort of disintegration of the military and then the, the use of that manpower to by either the leader, the overthrown leader or close associates, whoever, to come back, uh, uh, to come back and try and get in power. The other one, the second one, is uh, a, a form of a principal agent problem. You're all familiar with this principal agent idea. Um, so I'll give you a simple example to kind of drive this home. So, you know, I'm a homeowner and it rains and I have gutters uh, on my house and the gutters are constantly overflowing, right? They're getting jammed up with leaves. So am I gonna climb up there on my ladder and risk my life <laughs> to try and clean the gutters? No, I'm gonna hire somebody to come and clean the gutters. So they come, I may not even be home, and I'm sort of delegating this task to them. Uh, and so, but we don't have necessarily the same interests, right? I'd like them to clean my gutters, do a good job, and not charge me that much. They'd like to not do, not work very hard, get paid well, um, uh, and move on to the next place, right? So there's an interest asymmetry that's built in to the situation. Mm -hmm. And so this real life story, they come, a couple weeks later, my gutters are overflowing all over the place. I have to call them up and have them come back and they, sure enough, there was this giant thing in the gutter that they had somehow not managed to notice. Um, so there's, inf there's, all, so there's interest asymmetry and it's built in. There's information asymmetry, like I'm not necessarily watching them doing it. I don't know exactly what they're doing. Um, uh, they may be uh, bad agents, right? I, have, I don't know in advance whether they really share my interests or not. So this is what's going on uh, in regime change. States take somebody, put them in, and they delegate to them to run this state. Rather than me invading it, taking over it, having to occupy it, to paying the cost of doing it myself, I say, you do it for me. Um, and that would be great if there was no countervailing forces. Right? If it was a frictionless world, and they could just do what I wanted without any cost, uh, it would be okay. But in every country, there are competing domestic constituencies that have their own interests that are not necessarily the same as mine, the outside intervener. They can be a different political party. They could be a different ethnic group right, that got overthrown and wants to get back in power. They can be the military, the officer corps. Uh, that is displeased about something. There's a variety of sources of this. And so there's a preference divergence. There's two principles, outside and inside, 
that diverge in what they want. And then me, the imposed leader, becomes Gumby. Right? Oh, I'm being pulled one way. The intervener wants me to do X. But that's going to make these people really mad, and maybe they'll come after me. Oh, they want me to do Y. And, but if I do that, intervener over here is going to maybe come at me. So depending on which one I choose, I get civil war, interstate conflict. Uh, mm. And so it's called a problem of competing principles, right? There's with PALS principles, two actors who can affect the agent's survival, right? The political survival of the leader. They want different things, pull them in different directions, and depending on the choice he or she makes, get in trouble with one side or the other. So that's this, the military disintegration and the principal agent. Okay, so Probably. let me, uh, uh, one more question, I, uh, otherwise we're gonna keep talking. But, but <laughs> let me ask one question, just, so that's a, that's a very abstract um, argument right now. Let, let's put a little bit of the flesh on the bone. So mm -hmm. can you walk us through how this logic played out in Afghanistan? And, and the question I really have here is, you know, given your framework, given your evidence, was the American intervention in Afghanistan just doomed from the beginning, right? That just, it just didn't get it right. And this 20 years was playing out a string that was really determined in that first couple of years, maybe, because, because of the reasons you say, right? Mm -hmm. Because of the army and because of this competing principles problem. So, so I guess the two part is, one, can you just sort of walk us through like what that concretely looks like on the ground? And then two, did the United States ever have a chance at, at, at success, however we're going to define it, and you know, it could yeah. be democracy, it could be the absence of the civil war, or, or resurgent Taliban, or something like that. But did, did the United States ever have a chance, or, or would you say no? It was like it was cooked from the beginning. I would say the deck was stacked against it. Things were not. It was not a, a good-looking situation, mm -hmm. and so there's two two reasons for that. And they will, from what I just said, though, you will not be surprised. <laughs> One of them was that there was military disintegration. Um, and I would just say, as a side note, the way the United States fights wars is designed to cause military disintegration right. by the other side. Right? We don't want to fight these sort of straight attrition battles where we push them back in a series of set-piece battles. Don't we want to pierce the front with a blitzkrieg or uh, go around the side with a flanking maneuver? Uh, induce collapse, mm -hmm. uh, and so we're the way we fight is actually designed to induce this problem. But when you're trying to overthrow a foreign regime and you induce this problem, you get this result where uh, the enemy runs pell mell, uh, as it did, scatters all over the place, uh, and then a good portion of it, not all of it, uh, goes to Pakistan, where it gets. Although Pakistanis don't like to hear this aid and comfort, um, where they regroup and they plan their return. Um, so that's problem number one. Problem number two is comes after you decide, so there's this conference, they choose Hamid Karzai uh, to become the interim president, he's later elected, um, and you begin to see the interests diverge. Right At first, we're like, this guy is great, he's pro-democracy, he wants to work with us, he seemed like really compatible. Um, but over time, right, corruption, uh, drugs, the drug trade, and who's profiting from the drug, drug trade, um, the way the US wanted to fight the war versus the, uh, in terms of tolerance for civilian casualties, um, were very unpopular in, Afghanistan, and it got to the point where uh, they were, ba you know, almost not on speaking terms. Where Karzai would get up and denounce the United States, and you know, these people are, you know, doing all these terrible things, and the the it didn't, of course, devolve into violent conflict, mm -hmm. but it's the idea, like, of getting this person to sort of do what we want. There's a great line. Um, where some foreign diplomat says, like, never has, you know, one country had so little influence over what, the, you know, the leader of its protege, the, you know, says and does than the United States over Hamid Karzai. Um, and so that's where you see the, 
the interest divergence play out over time? I have to say, I, I saw that in real time. I was in a, a meeting <laughs> yeah, with uh, General McChrystal and, and Hamid Karzai. I was just literally a fly on the wall, but uh, watching it. And, uh, and those two men liked each other. Uh, and, and that was the relationship that was pretty much broken between the United States and Afghanistan at that point. And in the United States, despite all the money it was spending, despite all the troops in the country, everything, had so little leverage over Hamid Karzai in 2009 that it was remarkable. I mean, he just could not move him on anything at this point, even though the two men actually had a very uh, good and sort of frank friendship. Um, actually, in, in fact, Stan McChrystal yeah. went back, would hike with Karzai after, uh, <laughs> after he was um, fired from being a general. And, uh, but but he had, the leverage was almost gone. Yeah. So, okay, so just, okay, I know I said it was the last question, but I just, I just a little bit, just well, one I last. I didn't answer the rest of the question. Oh, okay, okay, good then, because I was going to follow up. So, so you, can, you can also see this playing out in Iraq with uh, Maliki. Right. right. Same deal. Like Maliki, your, your Shiite militias are taking drills to you know Sunni's heads and stuff. And uh, can you do anything about this? What? No, those they're terrorists. We completely immovable on this. Mm -hmm. Anyway, um, so you asked if they were it was doomed from the get go. Yeah. So I say that, you know the the structure of the situation, and I'm you know more of a structuralist on this. Mm -hmm. uh, was set up to make it very difficult. Now, the United States has, you know, made some own goals um, uh, in these situations. Um, in Afghanistan, it was the choice to completely marginalize the, the Taliban. Say, these guys are yesterday's news, they're toast, they have no role in the future Afghanistan, forget it. We don't need to include them at all. Mm. You see, you know, like Jim, Jim Dobbins, who was an, you know, working on this at the time, a negotiator saying, like, we just assumed they were dead meat, right? Why would we want to include them? Of course, ignoring that they're actually a large constituency uh, in the whole thing and sort of, by definition, excluding them. Um, uh, and that, you know, sort of guaranteed that they, their resistance would take a different, take a violent form. Mm -hmm. In Iraq, right, the own goals were debuffed, Huge, very widespread debothification plus uh, disbanding the military, mm. which just exacerbated the military disintegration problem. It was already there, but your chance of doing anything about it went out the door. Mm -hmm. right? So the situation, the conditions were already there, and the United States did some things that made their lives even more difficult. I mean, just to, just to pick up on that, and then I will stop talking, but the, it's just really interesting, like, both of those decision points are very, very early in the interventions. Yes. Right. Like, th those are, like, almost the first decisions being yeah. made. Yeah. And so if they're, you know, according to, you, I didn't mean, say you're a structuralist, but according to those, <laughs> that your theory, I mean, if there was wiggle room, it was gone quick. And the United States basically wasted the wiggle room it had that sort of golden hour or a golden series of months afterwards. Uh, and then once that, it was kind of like the horse is out of the barn and you can't get it back. Yeah, there's a couple of things to say about this. Um, so you might, you might say, well, okay, there's ways to, that principals can try to get agents, incentivize agents to do what they want. So even though there's this divergence, um, uh, there's, you know, you could try to give give them carrots. You could threaten them, um, but those things tend to not be effective in these situations. Why? Because uh, you've made a very powerful signal by intervening in a country, overthrowing its government, and putting me in charge. That you care mm. about. You have strong interests in my survival. Mm. So if I say, oh well, do X, and we'll give you. A million dollars, whatever it is, you know, bunch of bunch of nice stuff. You're like, you're going to give that to me anyway, whether I do what you want or not. Yeah. And if I say I won't take that away, you're like, no, you're not, because you want me to survive. And if you start doing that and weakening me, you know, uh, things will get things will get worse. Mm -hmm. um, so it become, you're in a very difficult situation because the sort of traditional things that uh, principal agent, right, people turn to, to say, you know, how do we manipulate costs and benefits to incentivize uh, our agent, uh, our, uh, our, 
much more complicated than me dealing with the gutter guys, right? right? The other thing I would say is it's, you know, it's so hard because what another solution to this would be to say, well, just intervene and have no interests. And this is the case so kind of in like some of these restorations, mm. right? When the United States and Britain and go, go back in 1944 onto the European continent, and they put these, you know, Belgians and Norwegians back in power. Like, they just want to restore democracy. They don't really care uh, what they're going to do because they sort of assume they'll, you know, just be nice, which mm -hmm. they were. Um, so there's no strong interest there. And if there's no, if you don't have any strong interest in the place, interest divergence doesn't matter. Right. Right? But it's almost always the case that you have some interest in the place. They're doing something that you don't like or you really need to, to whatever it is, right, that the, the, the interest divergence is almost de by definition built in. Mm -hmm. So basically, if you're going to do this, do this in Belgium, in a small <laughs> place that well, you don't care about, you don't have any interest, and you're ready to walk away. That's an implication, which is that defending and restoring the status quo is much easier than changing right. the status quo. Right. Right. You can use regime change defensively, and sometimes it will, it will work right. to take somebody who's recently been ousted and mm -hmm. replace, put them back in power. Um, but to change it uh, is much trickier. Okay, great. okay, I promise I'll stop talking now. Um, so Do I have to promise to? <laughs> you, know, you, get, you, have to you have to speak. But Beth's got a uh, microphone. If anyone wants to, we, we should do it for the, um, the people online so they can hear. Yeah, thank you. Hi there. Oh, hey. that's loud. It's loud, yeah. <laughs> we can hear you good. My name is Kyle. I'm uh, 22, but I am still here um, for a variety of reasons. Uh, but I took a gap year during COVID. But... Um, <laughs> I wasn't going to say 22 is that old to still be in college, but I don't know. No, I am a 22. He's, a, he's a, Everybody um, identifies the year they're going to graduate here. Um, so you're Dartmouth 22. You would graduate in, in 20, 2022. Um, but we're, yeah. Okay. okay. Sorry. Sorry, I'm an ignorant savage. <laughs> <laughs> we're, we're, we're catching him up on Dartmouth. Dartmouth. Turn <laughs> the lingo. <laughs> the lingo. It's crucial. Um, my question is about, I'm wondering if you can talk a little bit more about the goals of foreign regime change and whether you found patterns in doing so. Because you, you talk about like, you know, going in and uh, bringing democracy. Mm -hmm. But we've done a lot of, you know, at least the U.S. has done a lot of overthrowing of democratic elected leaders and mm -hmm. putting in place not so democratically elected leaders. Um, and certainly that's happened in other places you know, other superpowers have done the same thing around the world. So I'm wondering if you could talk a little bit more about like the goals and also the compositions of the governments that are being overthrown. Sure, this is a great question. Um, you tend to see regime changes for, you know, two or three or four big reasons. One is to, um, and they, they overlap. They're not just like, you know, completely hermetically sealed categories. One is, is for regional hegemony purposes. And this is the United States on its periphery in this hemisphere, um, uh, the Soviet Union uh, in its near abroad. Um, what Vladimir Putin would probably say now is his sphere of influence uh, in Ukraine. Um, and that's to, I dominate, this is my backyard. Uh, nobody's going to come into my backyard because I'm the big, the big dog on the block. Um, and if, say, communists start to, you know, with ties, ties or imagined ties to the Soviet Union, try to make inroads here, no, 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 we're not, we're not going to have that. This is, or if you, you know, a hundred years ago, if you were some tin pot Nicaraguan dictator and you wanted to not take loans from the United States, but rather take loans from Europeans, no way. We're not going to have that. Um, so it's about establishing or preserving, maintaining a sphere of influence. Um, another what you'd call uh, uh, offensive, for lack of a better word, um, sort of these are uh, you know, going after, uh, this was basically going after like Soviet client states uh, in, uh, after World War II. Um, trying to roll back 
influence uh, of other countries. Third is preventive, right? They haven't really done anything yet, but you're worried about what's to come. Well, Saddam might get a nuclear weapon, right? And he might give it to Al Qaeda, and we can't have that, right? Or, you know, and as, as I said, these things overlap, right? Guatemala, oh, you know, our Benz is doing these reforms, and he's got a few, there's like 500 communists in Guatemala, and they're getting too much influence. Um, we need to prevent something like something from happening. Uh, so move against them before uh, something adverse to our interests happens. Now, it's not the case that most foreign imposed regime changes are like the Germany and Japan cases, right? It's not, those are like when you want to change the regime of a great power, guess what? You have to fight a huge war, right? It's not going to, it's not going to work to send, you know, a few covert agents into Russia and take out Stalin and you live happily ever after, mm. right? So we have that, you know, in our brains as, you know, these famous cases, right, where you basically obliterate uh, Germany and Japan uh, and subjugate them. Mostly it's, the much more modal case is this U.S. Dominican Republic in 1916, U.S. Nicaragua in 1910-11, right? Mm -hmm. um, and what, you, what came to me anyway, when you look at these cases, is how, like, <laughs> not very important they really are. Um, so, you know, Zelaya in Nicaragua wanted to take loans from the Europeans. Like, is this really that big a deal? Um, Arbenz is doing land reform in Guatemala, right? He's actually, his idol is, guess who? FDR, right? Who's, and a lot of people in, in the U.S. government were like, he's only doing what we did. And we're like, mm, 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 right? That's, that's, land reform means, communism. means communism. Mm -hmm. um, so we can't have that. Um, mm -hmm. uh, Iran, you know, with uh, Mohammed Mossadegh, right? It was, he's, There'll be, there's an opening for uh, the two-day party, which is the Communist Party, uh, to, to take over. A lot of this is small beer and sometimes really imagined. Um, and even if it did come to pass, like, not super consequential. Um, and so, like, one of the, you know, this, this is a long way of answering this question, but it gets to another interesting question, which is like, well, if you don't do fur, what do you do, right, to deal with? Uh, these situations. I get asked this all the time. I'm like, well, think about like how badly, if the policy goes wrong, how bad will it be? And invading another country and, and overthrowing its leader and being stuck holding the bag when the place blows up is worse than like some sanctions or some diplomacy or like, you know, think of, do we want a new JCPOA with the Iranians or do we want to march to Tehran? Right, or have a big bombing campaign, right? It's, it's, you know, it's, there's other things you can do. Now, there's no magic bullet, right? Mm -hmm. Diplomacy sometimes fails. Sanctions don't work very well. Co coercive threats, they don't work very well either. But guess what? That's life in the international system. Um, and you're not always going to get your way. Right, and so just like learn to live with North Korea, right? What are we going to do? They have North, they have nuclear weapons now. Um, just not everything is uh, such a huge threat that it's worth, you know, take using this instrument that has a high high fail rate, higher backfire rate. Sometimes doing nothing is the best the best thing you can do, right? In these scenarios, doing nothing. Yeah. Oh. Yeah. Please. Hold it. Hello, uh, my name is Federico and I'm a junior. Um, I was curious to, uh, to hear your thoughts on uh, the trend of foreign imposed regime changes. Uh, first, uh, historically, looking at the trend, uh, has it been declining or becoming more popular? And also looking at the future, do you think that uh, foreign imposed regime changes will become more or less common also in mm -hmm. light of you know, the rising US-China Mm -hmm. competition mm -hmm. or the war in Ukraine? Mm. Yeah, so everyone 
uh, keeps saying, oh, no one will ever do that again. That's crazy. No more regime change. Uh, and then somebody, do <laughs> somebody does it or tries it, uh, as we saw this year. Um, so in terms of trends, over the last couple hundred years anyway, um, I have a, I think it's in the book, a, a, a graph that sort of shows over time. Uh, and in the first half of the 19th century, there's actually a bunch, and they're all of one kind. They're these restorations of like minor, you know, dukes and, and kings and queens in places like Parma and Saxony and Hesse, whatever, right? Um, uh, and then there's sort of a, a lull in the late, second half of the 19th century, and then a big, huge bump around World War II, World War I and World War II, right? That's massive. But then the Cold War was still pretty impressive. Now, uh, after the Cold War is relatively low, uh, so it's been somewhat less common, although it's been a, a shorter time period. Um, but it's been you know, some remarkable uh, ones that we've yeah. lived through. Um, and what you see, or what I see when I look at uh, what the US government's doing, and another really good book on this is uh, Philip Gordon's book. I'm going to forget the name of it. Um, it's about US regime changes in the Middle East. Um, and it's like, let's learn from our experience. OK, let's. Um, uh, we shouldn't go in heavy in Afghanistan because the Soviets went in heavy and look what happened to them. So we'll go in light. Oh, we can't control the country. So let's go in heavier in Iraq. Oh, that didn't work. Oh, we learned our lesson. Let's go in light in Libya uh, with no boots on the ground, essentially, just do air power. And it's, it's like if you keep getting you know, the same outcome, even though you keep trying you know, these different strategies, that should tell you something. Like, it's a search for the magic bullet. Um, and you know, so you know, after Afghanistan and Iraq, um, you know, and Obama comes in, people say, oh, we're, we're done. We're not doing this anymore. Um, no, we're just going to do it in a different way, <laughs> uh, which was Libya. Um, and now, you know, uh, Russia you know, really tried to do this and may still try to do it, depending on how the war goes. I hope not, um, uh, to go after Zelensky. And in the future, um, you know, China has not been a big player in foreign imposed regime change. They, have, they do not appear uh, in my data set in any of those 120 cases. At all? No. Hmm. They're targeted sometimes, right. by Japan especially, Japan, yeah. uh, before World War II. Mm. Um, uh, and they have chosen sort of other ways uh, to get their tentacles out, you know, a lot of which are you know, financial, this whole Belt and Road project. Let's uh, make big loans to countries in Africa, Latin America, with very little strings attached. Just buy your stuff from China. But you don't have to do austerity and all these things that the IMF will say if they come to give you money, mm. all this yucky stuff. Um, uh, and so I have so far you know, not gotten into this business. Um, and so, I mean, they, they obviously are interested in reintegrating Taiwan, but they wouldn't view that as a, as a regime change. Right? They're like, Taiwan's part of Taiwan of us. So that's not. But other countries like the United States might view it that way. Um, so I mean, I think I don't really see China going this route. I mean, things may change. Uh, Russia, uh, you could see, you know, not against NATO countries. I mean, I think that will after after Ukraine, that's going to be difficult for them to get away with. Uh, the United States, of course, like. We live and don't learn, right? That's our that's our motto. So uh, I, you know, I don't put it past us uh, to to do this again. But it has decreased in frequency relative to an era of world wars and global competition. Right now, you can't rule out if you get another bipolar competition between U.S. and China if they're competing in various parts of the world. 
that's what drove a lot of regime change during the Cold War, so that could happen. Is it generally true that they're getting more expensive, though, or longer? Like, I mean, just thinking, like, looking at Iraq, looking at Afghanistan, from World War II up, it seems like most of the heavy, long-term commitments, very expensive commitments, seem to be recent, right? More recent? Like <sighs> Russia and Ukraine. I mean, they may not have an army left. Yeah, I mean, you can say in many ways the Soviets were in Eastern Europe for uh, right. you know, 40 years, right. 45 years, um, and they faced some uprisings there uh, and did some restoration right. regime changes in Hungary and Czechoslovakia. Um, you know, it somewhat depends on the mode mm -hmm. of the way you do it. You know, if you work with uh, you know, uh, Carlos Castillo Armas in Guatemala and send a little air power Mm -hmm. uh, and convince the Guatemalan army that you will, you will invade uh, if they don't let Ar Castillo Armas and the rebels waltz into, into town, mm -hmm. um, then you're not holding the bag, mm -hmm. right? It may go wrong in other ways, like he gets assassinated in a few years. Um, uh, but yeah, if you choose to do it yourself uh, with all the sort of, a, you know, with your own military forces and you induce a military disintegration very quickly and you can't get out, Mm -hmm. Right. The United States wanted to get out immediately. Yeah. They were off ramping troops right away uh, in 2003. Um, but things went sour so quickly they couldn't get out. Couldn't get out yeah. um, so, but then you get things like Libya. Right? If you don't have uh, you know, boots on the ground, you have very little control over events, and a place can just disintegrate. Mm -hmm. right? And all of a sudden become, oh, Islamic State is here. <laughs> Uh, and Omar Gaddafi's huge armory of weapons is like going all over Africa yeah. uh, and causing all, all manner of problems. So, yeah, if you're, if you're going to do it yourself uh -huh. uh, and the thing goes south quickly, you you're, could be stuck. I'm you're stuck. you're Soviets in Afghanistan, you're United States in Afghanistan, yeah, blah, blah, blah. Oh, yeah. oh you, you turned it off, you maybe. Hey, my, my, well, yeah, there you go. <laughs> Great questions. Um, so on the first one, degree of involvement, right? When I gave you those sort of three ways, three modes of regime change, you can see how it gets progressively more difficult. So invading with your own army, that one's pretty much a no-brainer. Uh, public compellent or coercive threat, like leave town or else, uh, that's, pretty, that's pretty public too and, and relatively easy to measure. When you're working with domestic forces, that's where it gets the trickiest. Um, I try to be pretty conservative about this um, uh, in terms of there has to be agents of the state of the intervener on the ground working for overthrow, whether violently or not. So that can, that can be you know, covert military agents or it can be people with bags of cash to give to other people. Um, there has to be, uh, in hindsight anyway, the evidence that you can find that that was the intent. Like, this is what we're doing here. We're trying to overthrow this government. And third, that, uh, it, which is a counterfactual and very hard to gauge in some cases, was the, was the operation likely to succeed without the outside involvement? And so I have a half a dozen cases that I put inside the line. The hardest one is the one you mentioned, which is the, the Chilean case. Um, you know, 
there's different ways of dealing with this. You say, oh, I, I'll exclude that case. Does it change anything? No, it doesn't change anything in the broader patterns. Um, but that's sort of the hardest one. Um, others, it's, it's, you know, there's fights over the degree of involvement, but they kind of make my, uh, my list. So ultimately, I include that one. Um, but uh, the covert ones that I was talking about from Lindsay O'Rourke's book, she has 25 successful covert ones, and I only have six. Right, so I exclude all the stuff where I can't make a very clear connection. So like the United States was spending money on non-communist political parties in Italy and France and these kinds of places. It was promoting democracy in Poland in the 1980s, right? This had something to do with it, no doubt, but it's very hard to attribute causality there. So I generally stayed away from, from those. Um, in terms of attempts versus successes, what I look at is uh, the effects of the successful uh, overthrows, but I often compare them to a sample of ones that failed. Now, it's hard to find <laughs> ones that failed because they get much less press, but there are many that are known. Uh, 1956, Britain, France, Israel, against Nasser, the Suez War. They were trying to get rid of Nasser. It's pretty clear, right? So I include that. So uh, the uh, Entente intervention in the Soviet Union in 1918 to 22, right? They're trying to get rid of the Bolsheviks, right? And get Russia back in the war. Um, and what's nice is sometimes I can use the, I can say, well, uh, it helps me to attribute causality because I'm saying, well, there wasn't one here, but there, it succeeded here, it failed here. Do I see uh, you know, the bad effects from the successes and not from the failures, and it turns out that that's the case in, uh, a lot of the time. Then your third question was, refresh my memory, um, gone into so stream of consciousness mode. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. <sighs> yeah, so I, you know, there's various ways to slice and dice these things. Um, I sliced and diced them by what they were trying to do with the regime itself, whether it was just let's chop off this leader, plop on another leader's head, so on, and go. So that's leadership. Whether they try to uh, build new institutions, whether they're replacing, uh, putting the leader back in power who was just out, um, uh, and not so much the substantive motivation that would be also interesting to, to oh, was it anti-communist? Was it, I tend to not be a big believer in economically motivated. This is, I mean, these are the, like the conspiracy theories, oh, no blood for oil, right? And, and all this stuff. And uh, in a separate article, uh, I looked at this with some co-authors um, and we were able to get trade data for the United States and all countries in Central and, and South America, um, bilateral trade data. And we had the regime change um, uh, uh, data. And one of the big arguments is, well, you know, Guatemala was for bananas, right? Chile is about copper or ITT. There's all this corporate influence going on. So if that's the case, you might expect, you know, trade to go up. Uh, afterwards, or those companies to get preferential treatment. Uh, and surprisingly, uh, successful regime changes reduced bilateral trade. And the companies, the, the paradigmatic cases of Guatemala and Chile, does anyone know what happened to the big banana company, United Fruit Company, in Guatemala right after the intervention? The United States government filed an antitrust suit against it, and they li had to liquidate their entire holdings in Guatemala, right? So if it was all about UFCO pr uh, profits, they sure had a weird way of showing it. In Chile, uh, Allende had nationalized uh, the copper mines, um, and so, you know, Nixon was meeting with these executives, and there's all this, like, you know, conspiracy theories about they were they were pushing this and responsible for it. Sure, that they wanted to get rid of Allende, but the United States government was like, 
we don't like Allende because he's a communist, uh, and we're not going to stand by and let Chile go uh, communist under our nose. Um, and so what happens to, I'm forgetting the name of the copper company, Anaconda Copper, they never get their mind back. <laughs> they get a small pittance from it, end up getting acquired by some other company and going out of business. Right? So economic motivations, you know, you could, we could fight about them, but uh, I just haven't found really strong motives that's usually much more, I think, political uh, in, in intent. Mm -hmm. Yeah, please. It's working. It's working. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Hello, Professor. Oh, there you go. Uh, my name is Mohammed. Uh, I'm a transfer student from Afghanistan, and I recently came to this college. Um, uh, first of all, I would like to I would like to thank you for your thoughts and time. Uh, I want to be very specific. I want to focus on Af uh, Afghanistan, Iraq, and U.S., which I personally named the Triangle of Oblivion. Uh, kind of what? Oblivion. My first... <laughs> yeah. You start, like, sometimes uh, you, your book... I didn't read the book, but I, it came through but the, you will the comments. Yeah, <laughs> so many assignments. Uh, you focused on how few of the elements which may evolve into the the failed re re regimes or something. Uh, some maybe U.S. invaded Afghanistan and Iraq with the uh, with the thinking of national interests, which evolved into a very unexpected ending. And you mentioned Hamid and the involvement of Pakistan, but uh, I want to focus about how sustaining it was hard for the U.S. and why it failed, mainly focusing on two elements. In case of Iraq, I want, I want your uh, emphasis on the Kambuka, existence of Kambuka, which is a birthplace of ISIS. And in Afghanistan, I want your uh, thoughts on warlords, endorsement and funding of the warlords. Kambuka in Iraq was sort of the it's often seen as the sort of birthplace of ISIS where a lot of people were scooped up, put into Kambuka, and it's sort of radicalized within, uh -huh. coming out of the okay. UCCA. And then the second question was oh, on the warlords. Yeah, yeah because yeah. US heavily invaded warlords when they invaded Afghanistan beside making Hamid Karzai the president. Thank yeah. you. Hmm. So the, the Iraq case, um, Again, I emphasize certain factors that I've already talked about. Now, the United States did what, in retrospect, we might say are some dumb things uh, and some inhumane things uh, in, in Iraq. Um, with that, the example you bring up being first and foremost, um, the just sort of general, you know, breaking down doors, grabbing people, running in on families, um, uh, without respect for, you know, uh, the gender sensitivity uh, in in a, in a Muslim country, uh, grabbing people, taking them away by the thousands, uh, locking them up with very little evidence, detaining them for a long time, and then, um, you know, allowing or having the kinds of abuses that that happened uh, in some of those places. Um, that breeds discontent. Um, so that, of course, makes people who weren't sympathetic already perhaps you know, sympathetic and ready to be recruited. Um, so there's certainly things that the intervener can do beyond what the sort of forces that I've laid out uh, to uh, you know, dig their own grave, so to speak, or make their problem much worse. Um, the warlords in Afghanistan, yeah, so Afghanistan, well, I won't, I won't talk about that because you already know all that. Um, but yes, working with warlords, so the United States didn't like, well, didn't like this. 
Um, but for Karzai, I think it was essential, uh, or at least he thought so, and to, for him to, to gain control over the country. There were these powerful figures, um, and they demanded certain things. And so a lot of money went uh, you know, from government coffers to the warlords. Um, and this was a source of interest divergence with the United States, because the United States saw this as corruption. Corruption is bad. Stop doing that. Um, uh, whereas for Karzai, this was sort of essential for his political survival. Like, it's a difference, you know, not understanding the sort of lay of the land uh, that you're trying to deal with, and not understanding what the leader's own, you know, uh, necessities or imperatives are for their own political survival domestically. Um, so again, that's a source of, for me, a source of interest divergence. Um, that drives the two, the two sides apart over time. Mm -hmm. Oh, he's got the mic. Oh, I'm sorry, I didn't see. Oh, I didn't see. I'm sorry, I didn't see the mic. Yes, go ahead. <laughs> oh, we don't hear you. No, it's a trick mic. This is apparently like no. you need a PhD or multiple oh, PhDs. Uh, guy, whatever, yeah. we can figure it out. Oh, is it okay? This sounds good. Hi, Professor. I'm Nathaniel, and I'm a 26 from New York City. I have two questions for you. First is on interest divergence in Afghanistan specifically, but I guess this could be applicable to other situations as well. Um, I read a book called The American War in Afghanistan, and in it, the author really made the point that one of the reasons that made the Afghan government just fall apart was that it was kind of it wasn't really seen as being Afghan. It was kind of seen as being imposed by these foreigners. Um, and in contrast, the Taliban kind of stood more for what it meant to be Afghan. And my question is, when you have that interest divergence, and when you have Karzai going on TV and saying, no, U.S., you will not kill Afghan civilians, mm -hmm. and doesn't that kind of help him signal to his people that he's not a puppet and that he is supportive of the Afghans, and therefore, can't that interest divergence be a way that he consolidates power and foreign interventions can maybe be successful? That's question number one. Well, there's another one after that? There is. Oh, yeah. Yeah. That's a good question. Okay. Yeah, that's a good question. <laughs> I'll start with that one. Um, there's a couple of ways to, to go at this one. Um, one is the, the question of the basis of the... the I'm not familiar with the exact book, but this this assumption. It's right? Greater Caucasians. Oh, okay. Yeah. Um, I think you guys had them last year, actually. We did. Taught in the class. Yeah. Um, that uh, the, the Karzais and the people in the government are, are foreign toadies, and the Taliban are the, uh, the more authentic movement. Um, you know, that assumes that only people who resist are nationalists, right? And that people who, uh, you know, try to run the country are not, don't have the sort of countries, are not also nationalists. And they just diverge on what strategies to use. Right? So people who emphasize nationalism as a source of resistance, they tend to uh, assume nationalism, the, the only response that nationalism causes is resistance. And so then you'd say, well, the only real nationalists in Afghanistan are the Taliban. It's like, really? There's no other nationalists in Af Afghanistan? Uh, Hamid Karzai didn't love his country, you know, and the, the Afghan people uh, you know, didn't, didn't care about that. Um, just because they're working with, with the assistance of an outside power. So not to say that that's never true. <laughs> like a lot of leaders who... Uh, are brought into power by foreigners are exiles or people who haven't been in the country in a long, long time. Um, and then you think, boy, these are carpetbaggers, Johnny Come Latelys. They're v it's very clear they're sort of artificial uh, from the outside and they don't have deep roots in the country. Karzai had deep roots in the country, right? He's not some uh, interloper. Um, so that's one thing. Um, uh, yeah, the, the, he's, he was doing 
right? In this situation, right, he's got an intervener that wants to prosecute a war more aggressively. He's got a population that is really unhappy about being killed. Um, uh, in many cases, you know, just either by accident or they got the wrong intelligence or they think this is a Taliban uh, band when it's a wedding and all kinds of things like this. Um, so he's, he's Gumby, right? He's getting pulled uh, in two different directions. And he's uh, playing to his domestic audience, right? So that he can you know, score political points and be more popular at home and be seen as defending their interests, which after all, he was elected to do, right? Um, uh, but yeah, the, that exasperates the hell out of the Americans mm. because they want to fight the, the war the way they want to fight it. And uh, this guy's throwing up roadblocks and being uncooperative and getting in the way. Um, so it may, you know, if we think of governance as a, you're supposed to be responsive to your electorate, not say some outside power. Yeah, that's working. But it's causing this conflict because you have two masters, right? Um, so yeah, that, that's, that's where the, the problem is coming from. Okay. Um, second question. question sec, second question. So if like foreign imposed regime change is uh, not very successful at, I guess, creating societal change, um, is there still a possibility that when you're a country like the United States that has so much soft power, they can kind of, like, I guess, attract people to supporting political institutions that um, we would like without kind of imposing that regime change on them. Do you think that's a better way of su spreading democracy, trying to use our soft power? Um, and I, I, I think you can look at basically all of the former Soviet Union that now are incredibly enthusiastic about wanting to be part of NATO, you know, democracy, capitalist, as an example of that. Short answer, yes. <laughs> I mean, I'm, there's various ways of soft power um, uh, for influencing um, foreign governments. And unfortunately, the, the studies aren't, that I'm aware of anyway, Jay may know more, are not consistent. Um, some say, you know, show democracy assistance being helpful in, in increasing democracy in a target country. Others show like democracy assistance uh, actually worsens relations. Um, uh, some show, um, is it humanitarian? So this is Jessica Trisco Darden's book, mm -hmm. um, that providing humanitarian assistance actually can worsen uh, either, is it government atrocities or relations between the, the two states? Yeah. Um, so, yes, in principle, although the mechanisms, right, it depends, like, do you want, you know, at the, at the one extreme you have military intervention, regime change, things like that. At the other you have, we're just the city, the shining city on the hill. Of course, then you want to have a good example of the shining city on the hill, uh, of just, were they, you know, something to emulate. We're not going to go out and try and do anything. And then you have a lot of in-between of what kind of aid can we provide um, to sort of optimize uh, the, the chances. Um, and I, I'm, you know, quite, for the most part, in favor of trying to help uh, without, you know, doing the sort of more extreme stuff. Uh, that you see in here. Um, but it's tricky, right, to find, and I'm not like so steeped in that literature to know like which exact sort of um, instruments mm -hmm. uh, are, are best for that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, go ahead. Yeah. Hi, my name is Christian, I'm a 26, and I guess my question is a little more for clarification, but you had mentioned homogeneity for being a factor which helps uh, prime countries for democracy if they are to make that transition. So I guess my question is, why is diversity uh, oppositional to promoting democracy? Yeah, this is more of a 
comparativist question, but uh, so if you think of having multiple ethnic groups uh, in a country and uh, uh, trying to get them to cooperate, um, it's more difficult than just having a, a single homogeneous population um, uh, to get things done because you don't have to like do you know, work out these you know coalition cabinets where everyone has different interests and try to sort of you know uh, uh, there may be more likely to be violent conflict um, uh, and so studies have found that countries that have more home it used to be thought like way back John Stuart Mill was like democracy only works in in homogeneous places now. I'm not saying that. I'm saying more likely uh, to is a building block. Now it's not impossible, right? By any stretch of the imagination, we're dealing in likelihoods and probabilities here. But it has been found to be one thing that it can increase uh, the likelihood of of democratic transition. You mentioned. Oh, sorry. You mentioned that um, most of your data set, like your data set, was drawn post 1815. Um, was that just like kind of ease of collecting data, or was it like uh, underlying factors that arose around that time, like changes in how legitimacy is defined, changes in mm -hmm. kind of state relations and the, and the use of force that um, made you pick that kind of starting point? There are many answers to this question. One is um, in political science and international relations specifically, uh, we have the data we have, which I would not say good, is good, but it exists, is mainly starts in, uh, after Napoleon. So it's it's sort of 1816 uh, is is the starting point for a lot of things. Now I thought I was like Mr. Weirdo by going back before 1945, right? So if you're an aficionado of civil wars and you and you look at that literature, it's basically all post-1945, because the data is better if you want to do anything mm -hmm. statistical. He's a weirdo, too, right? because he goes back to 1800. Yeah. Um, the second is practical. Like, you got to draw the line somewhere. I remember I was uh, talking to somebody at my old alma mater, the University of Chicago, and he's an expert in um, Renaissance Italy. And he's like, well, all these city-states are doing, you know, overthrowing each other's princes and governments and stuff. And you could look at that. I'm like, uh, yeah, I could. Um, so, you know, the warring states period in China and yeah. Japan, and there's tons of, uh, you know, the Greek city states back way back in the day where you could look at this. Um, I just said tractability. I'm gonna I'm gonna draw the line here, and it's of course right after the French Revolutionary Napoleonic period where there was. Regime change is happening mm -hmm. uh, all over the place. Um, uh, so, you know, it's partially data, partially tractability. Um, but, you know, if I wanted to keep doing this for the rest of my life, I could go, you know, further back. You know, and of course, but there's going to be changes, right, over time. So before that, in the 18th century, you had the age of absolute monarchies, and there's a lot of monarchic solidar solidarity, right? Yeah. Our right to rule is given by God. So I don't want to start overthrowing other, mo other monarchs because then it looks like, huh, maybe there's, that's not so true. Before that, though, in the wars of religion, right, if you weren't a Catholic or a Protestant, like, I'll go after you. Um, and so a, a great book on this, John Owen, uh, what's his book called? I can't remember. Yeah teaches at the University of Virginia, it'll come to me. Yeah. Um, he looks at foreign regime promotion, which is not quite the same thing as regime change, it's promoting your own kind of government. And he goes way back, you know, to like 1500. And you see these waves, right? Uh, higher in that era, wars of religion goes down in the 18th century, goes back up, and like this and like this. You know, when there's, for him, it's these big ideological clashes in the system. Right, whether it's Catholicism versus Protestantism, republic versus monarchy, mm -hmm. democracy versus fascism, communism, right? 
so for him, then, you know, okay, what now? Uh, and it was no surprise to me that his book after that was about Islam. <laughs> Yeah. You should just tell him very quickly uh, how long it took to write the book, so he has an appreciation for the, the data collection underneath it. Because really, it's, well, I don't want to tell him. I, it's I a mean, long time. you just talk in round numbers. You don't have to give the exact number, but just give him a sense. So that <sighs> you know, I started. I started working on this in two thousand seven. So yeah. I was. I had a year off. Uh, where we met. This is where I met That's right, Jay Lyle, was That's at Harvard right. that year. Yeah. And my book was, my first book was coming out. So I'm like, oh, my next big thing is going to be foreign post regime change. But I started out looking, I was gathering data, like trying to find these things. And it was kind of about the causes of regime change. Um, and I, I write in the preface to the book, I had this very, in retrospect, helpful and funny meeting with my, my former dissertation advisor, a guy named John Mearsheimer. Who proceeded? We had lunch at a conference in 2008 and proceeded to yell at me about how I was wasting my time and how the really interesting thing was the, the effects of foreign imposed regime change. And it always fails. And so here's your argument just say that. I was like, um, but I changed the direction of the project. Um, you know, I started, started working on papers. I had a direct, you know, did the Civil War analysis first, I had this democracy paper. Um, uh, and then, you know, it was like how to sort of, you know, it's the craft of, who knows this very well, like what goes in and what doesn't go in. Um, and the three things that are in the book, this sort of civil war, leader removal, conf the conflict variables, outcomes, uh, have a common explanation, right? And I was going to do the democracy, democratization bit, right, that I explained before, but that has a different, slightly different logic to it. Uh, and so it became like, over time, I'm like, this has got to get kicked out uh, because it just doesn't really fit. And it's going to take a whole different theoretical thing and it's going to complicate my life. Um, so basically, over the course of a decade or so, uh, was the active work on it. I'm going to capture that sound, that oof you made collectively as my ringtone now, because it was, it was hilarious <laughs> oh. when you said that no one could believe how long it took to do it. But, but well, good, you hold the record, I think. So. I, well, I don't, I don't know about that, but I, good social science takes a long time, particularly if you're going to be policy relevant and, and sort of inject your ideas into the policy. But you better be sure you're right. And that, that takes time, right? And it, it just does. There isn't really a shortcut to that kind of work. If, if you want people in, in D.C. to listen to you and... You want to be sure you're right. I mean, not everybody does that. That's why I think the book is so terrific, right? Is there's a lot of people to take the shortcuts. You did not. It takes a long time to do the quality work, and but but we trust it, right? When we get it, and you see it, and you're like, I, I, you believe what you're being told. That's not always true in the uh, the sort of punditry circles in D.C. And no, oh no. So uh, we have exhausted our time, and, and your time is already past six o'clock. So wow. please join me in thanking Dr. Downs for Thank a wonderful time. Appreciate it. Great questions.